I'm Lou Scott, and this is the Geppetto Room, where you don't have to be creative to be creative. You just have to be you. Because here we're going to go over methodologies and techniques to help you make better decisions, creative decisions, transformative decisions, to enrich the way you live, the way you work, and the way you thrive in our state. Today I have three guests. And these guests are real stakeholders in trying to get a welcoming, trying to get a reputation for Vermont in the Rutland area to be a truly welcoming place so we can attract people because we need people to come here. So a welcoming place, we're going to be talking about that and we have three guests. The three guests are Mary Fellman, who's the executive director of the Parent Child Center of Rutland County. We have Al Wakefield, who is the co-member, member, founding member with Bob Honish of the Declaration of, of Inclusion. And, the, and that last, we have, finally, we have Lyle Jepson, who is the executive director of the chamber and the, and the economic development of the Rutland region. Now, we'll be, talk, we'll be talking about how we can attract people, as I said, attract people to our state because that's what we need. And these people are stakeholders, and so are you. There'll be an emphasis on, on DEI, equity, diversity, and, and inclusion, because from my opinion, they're the most important elements to their strategies. Now, DEI, in my opinion, is the fundamental, fundamental strategies, the, the underpinning. If we really want to create a place where people want to come to, to live and play and thrive, then we have to really practice the idea of welcoming and diversity and, and equity and, 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 the implement, and the inclusion are certainly things that we have to emphasize. And we'll be emphasizing that today. Now, obviously, DEI is the right thing to do. It's the ethical thing to do. It's a human thing to do. But to Vermonters, it has a very practical side. That practical side is to bring people into our state help track to attract people into our state so they can thrive. We have Vermonters, as you know, and I've said it many times, we have a demographic problem. Actually, it's a crisis that's eroding our values, our economic values, our monetary values that we come to expect and enjoy. And if we don't attract young people, people that come here and live and, 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 and enrich what we're doing here in the state, we're going to have a very grim future. We need people to do this. We need people to help. Now, we all must share the responsibility. We all, have, we all are stakeholders, like these three people. My, my, these guests are doing transformative activities to help create a welcoming environment to attract people. So stick around. I think this is going to be a very informative and educational program. You might, you might it'll, hopefully it'll prompt ideas on your part to, to get involved in this welcoming incentives. Also, it also might, you might want to get involved in the initiatives that these three stakeholders are actually carrying out right now. So, I'm going to, now here's how we're going to do it. We're going to have a, a presentation from each one of the individuals. We'll start with Al, We'll go to Lyle, and then we'll go to Mary. This one will make a presentation of what they're currently doing and what, what the future they're going to be doing in relationship to the mission we all have on this show. After that, we'll have a Q&A. So one last thought before we get to it. There are many misconceptions, many misnomers, many false facts about DEI, about diversity, involvement, over equity and, and inclusion. Well, I say, if you want to get the best out of this show, the best ideas for yourself and for the, our state, clear your mind. The diversity, e equity, and inclusion should be unconditional. So clear your mind, and, you should, you, and you'll get a much more, much more important aspects of these shows will come out to you as you, as you view it. So stick around. With that, let's get to it. Okay, our first presentation will be from Al Wakefield. Al? Well, thank you, Lou. Uh, good to be here. 
Uh, hopefully, you can all hear me uh, okay. Uh, normally, I'm, uh, I'm here with, uh, with Bob Harnish. Uh, Bob Harnish is really the person who, uh, uh, who came up with the idea to uh, take a declaration of inclusion across the state. Uh, Bob Harnish is a long-term resident of, uh, of Vermont, having established the Cortina Inn, uh, one of the finest inns at the time in Vermont. Uh, and I've known Bob for a long, long time. Bob and I have worked on some things uh, together in, in Rotary and other initiatives as such. Bob, uh, about a year and a half ago, was struck by uh, the, what happened to George, uh, George Floyd and uh, also Breonna Taylor and several other uh, black folks who were uh, uh, killed, were murdered. And uh, also, he was struck by the words of John Lewis, uh, and, and, and what are we doing about this? And Bob says, you know, I'm a white guy. I've been in Vermont a good portion of my life. Uh, and I'm feeling like I want to do more. Um, and Al, what should I be doing? And I said, Bob, I don't know what you should be doing. Uh, but here's some things to read. Here's some thought-provoking things. Uh, uh, take them and see, see what you think. Bob went away, and I, I, I should have known better. Bob. Bob normally, uh, is, his style is to grab a hold of stuff and never let it go, right? But I said, Bob's just another white guy. He's just gonna, feeling guilt. He's just going to read this stuff, and that's the last I'm going to hear. Well, four months later, Bob comes back, and he said, I've read it, and I've got an idea. And he said, the town of Franklin has just, a, just approved, just adopted a declaration of inclusion. And what I'd like to do is to work on this initiative. And uh, I'd like for you to join me. What do you think? And so Bob and I kicked around some ideas. And uh, uh, we decided that, in fact, we would, uh, we would take this initiative across the state. Uh, Brandon, uh, Vermont, was the second town to, uh, to adopt this Declaration of Inclusion. And, and let, me, let me read uh, what most towns have adopted and the state of Vermont as well. Uh, the Declaration of Inclusion says the following. The town of, fill in your, your, your town, condemns racism and welcomes all persons, regardless of race, color, religion, national origin, sex, gender identity or expression, age or disability, and wants everyone to feel safe and welcome in our community. Second paragraph. As a town, we formally condemn all de uh, discrimination in all of its forms, commit to fair, fair and equal treatment of everyone in our community, and will strive to ensure all of our actions, policies, and operating procedures reflect this commitment. Paragraph three. The town of, fill in your town, has and will continue to be a place where individuals can live freely and express their opinions. Signed and dated by the select board, X date, 2021, 2022, uh, etc. And so since now, I, I think somewhere around 14 to 15 months or so, we now has, have, rather, as of today, 42 towns that have adopted uh, this declaration of, of inclusion in one form or another. In addition, the state of Vermont, the governor of, De of uh, Vermont, Governor, uh, governor Scott, uh, has uh, issued a proclamation uh, supporting the declaration as well as proclaiming that the second week in May of each year is Inclusion Week in Vermont. And there are a bunch of activities and agenda, agenda et cetera, which go along, go along with that. Um, and several planning commissions, interestingly enough, have adopted this declaration uh, as well. The, it, the declaration, rather, is important. Uh, uh, that is, the adoption of it is important. But what is really just as important is implementation. What are you going to do about what it is you said you proclaim or that you adopt and that uh, you, you, you say you support and are going to do something about it? So what is that something you are going to do? And so we have a website, uh, which is uh, vtdeclarationofinclusion.org, written all one word, vtdeclarationofinclusion.org, which you can go to, and there are guidelines for adoption as well as for implementation uh, of uh, the Declaration of, of Inclusion. And we invite everybody who's looking in on this, uh, this show to, uh, to go and, uh, and take a look at it, and also invite you to contact me, Al alwakefield-global.com, to, uh, to talk more about it. As I said, some 42 towns plus the state of Vermont plus a couple of uh, planning commissions have adopted. And our plans going forward, Lou, are that uh, the, the rest of the 210 towns in Vermont will adopt. So by May of this year, our, our target was 50. Uh, by May of next year, uh, it's 50 more, and then we'll see where we go from there. So 
our, our strategy is that the largest to the smallest towns, but starting with the largest towns, hopefully uh, will adopt the Declaration of Inclusion uh, and, and move forward on, on implementation. And so as, as somebody in the Vermont uh, Interfaith uh, Action Group said, we're coming to your town. Uh, what we're doing has the active support of uh, the Vermont Chamber of Commerce. In fact, they established the, web the website for us, uh, the Vermont League of Cities and Towns, uh, as well as the uh, NACP, the Rutland NACP, and the Security Equity Caucus, and Abundant Sun, with whom we've been working uh, very closely. Interesting enough, Lyle uh, Jepson, who is on this panel, uh, what he did in Rutland was one of the keys to us being able to move forward on, on this initiative because Lau talked about the economic aspects of, of, and, and the, the impact on business, bringing businesses and bringing talented people to this community. And that, that thrust has been an integral part of, of our initiative and it's been picked up by the Vermont Partnership, I think. You know, because the moral aspects are obvious. Even if you don't accept them, they are obvious, right? The economic aspects of this whole thing are very, very real and just as important. Dying, down, dying downtowns uh, as you go across the state, you are struck by, on a Saturday afternoon, that there's nobody in downtown X town uh, Vermont, right? Uh, except for three or four towns or so. And you look up. There's nobody in those places up above the ground level. So we need people. Uh, there's real estate here, perhaps not housing for, uh, for, for people, but we need people to fill the real estate that's here in terms of businesses. We need skilled people. And that's what we hope the Declaration of Inclusion will help bring about. Okay. Thanks, Al. I appreciate that. Thank Sounds you. good. Sounds on a mission. Lyle, you're up. Well, thank you for, for having us, Lou. Um, We've been absolutely inspired by Al and Bob, and their work is, is integral to what we're doing economic development-wise. And yes, it's the right thing to do, and we need to start there. We need to start by saying this is an imperative. It's also a marathon and not a sprint. So this is something that is gonna take time and patience and Al and Bob are taking that time and are being very patient as they talk to people about how important this initiative is. Beyond that it's right, it's economically right. Because if you look at our needs here in, in the state, and particularly in Rutland County, we're, we're vying to be the oldest county in the state of Vermont. Over the last 10 years, the average age of the person in the workforce has increased by five years and that will continue, which just means more people are gonna be retiring and we don't have people coming in the other end to fill those seats and to fill those jobs. And there are no reason why, there's no reason why some of our bigger employers need to be here if we can't provide them with a labor force. And so one of our goals, and it started about seven years ago, seven years ago, some of our largest companies came to us and said, we need more people, and when we put out an ad, there's nobody that's applying for these positions. So we realized as part of our economic development piece, it was our role to step in and try and help bring more people here because it was an economic imperative. So we began what we called a regional marketing initiative, and that regional mar marketing initiative is a 10-year plan, and in that 10 years, we'll certainly reevaluate as we go. I fully expect it's gonna be a 20-year plan, because marketing is not anything that you ever stop. And Lou's smiling because he's been in the marketing world and he knows you never stop marketing. You didn't see the largest automotive dealers stop marketing when they could not find computer chips to make vehicles. They kept marketing because they knew the computer chips are gonna come around and we don't want you to forget that Ford and Toyota are out there. We need to do the same thing. We need to keep marketing our region because our region needs more people, as Al just said. So through our regional marketing initiative, um, we did some research. We found out that Rutland Public Schools has a 12.5% 12, 12 of Rutland Public Schools students are not white, which is way higher than the average for the state of Vermont. Rutland is going to change naturally, and that's a good thing. And Rutland will bring in a diverse group of people but we need to be welcoming to that diversity. And so we realized through our regional marketing initiative that we had missed a piece. 
And that's where Al and, and Bob stepped in. We missed the piece that we were not doing anything DEI. We thought we were. We were saying we are the most welcoming place and we put out signs and isn't this a welcoming place? <laughs> but we didn't take a look at that and say, okay, what, what's in the sign? Well, it's interesting, we, we had a, a festival that we were gonna put on, we put up a sign, it had lots of people in it. I looked at the sign, they were all white. And I said, okay, so this is where we need to start. We need to refocus our lens here and say, when we put out marketing materials, when we talk the talk, what are we saying? And how are we changing our behavior, both as an organization and as how we're reflecting the region? So as we're doing more marketing, we're very conscious of the fact of who's in the picture, um, what is being said as we're marketing the area, because we know we're not, we can no longer market to me, the old white guy. We can't do that anymore. We need to market to everyone. And it's Rutland and Vermont will not look the same 10 years from now. And when somebody, someone called me up from Chicago the other day, because we have this regional marketing initiative, you can go to realrutland.com and you can get a concierge by clicking on a little button, and that concierge will end up being Bethany Sprague, who will answer the phone and will say, hey, how can we help you? Well, she connected me with a gentleman from Chicago. Almost his first question was, when you look outside your door in your office, Lyle, is there going to be anybody that looks like me walking down the street? And I said, well, what do you look like? And he said, I'm not a white person. And I said, you will be in the minority, but that's something we want to change. We want to have more people here. We want to have diversity here. And if you ask our Rutland Young professionals, they'll say, I want a different restaurant than, I love McDonald's, than McDonald's. I want a different restaurant where I can go out and have an experience. And we love the restaurants we have here now, but I want a different experience. I want something that's different than what I'm, I'm used to. So our regional marketing initiative has within its plan DEI. And we have adopted a statement of inclusion as an organization. We have a diversity, equity, and inclusion committee. We hired a consultant to come in because we didn't know what we didn't know. And I think I'm saying the right things, but I don't know that I'm doing and saying the right things because I'm looking from Lyle's lens of a white person living in Vermont for my entire life associating with people that are just like me, and I think I'm saying the right thing. So now we've gone through training. Our board went through training. Every board member went through training, and then we set up this DEI committee, and now we, are, we have a strategy, and within that strategy, we're looking at what are we saying, what are we doing, how are we acting, how do we want to say things, how do we want to act, and I think it will change our behavior. And we're excited about that. It will bring people. And if you look at the population and how the population's changing around the United States, it's not increasing with people that look like me. And so I need to be welcoming, excited, and open to change. Thank you, Lyle. That was well said. Well, I hope we get, it sounds interesting that we're well ahead of the game, hopefully, and we'll be, we'll be trying to accomplish these things in 10 years, and I'm going to ask what we're doing right now when we get to the Q&A. Mary, you're next. Oh, boy, there's so much you're to say. Um, so, first of all, thanks again for uh, inviting me to your show. Uh, I have learned a lot from you, Lou, through the years about um, creative thinking and one of the first things that pops into my mind is, can we be honest about what the problems are, right? So it's hard to change problems if you're not allowed to say, I see a problem. And then after you identify the problem, how do you creatively respond to it? Or um, how, do you, how do you implement? So I'm really excited to hear about the Declaration of Inclusion. I'm excited to hear about the trainings that, that you all are doing. Um, I would love to have a Declaration of Inclusion for my agency. Uh, you know, I, I think that that's a, a really um, definitive way of saying this is who we are and this is, this is what we stand behind. It's, it's very straight up. Um, the George Floyd uh, murder was something that really shifted our agency as well because there was a time where there was a lot of protesting going on on TV and in our local community and there was uh, a lovely demonstration of peace that took place in uh, the park and uh, the staff at the Parent Child Center decided they want to participate in this. 
and we went and we were you were there and we handed out a very simple flyer and the flyer said that the Rutland County Parent Child Center believes that racism is bad for children's health period it's a very simple thing and and that was almost perceived as radical <laughs> um, so and that was a statement that we had you know went to a child development specialist at Harvard so that they could back up our simple thinking um, but this is common sense this is this is a very common sense thing so the next step that our agency did was we wanted to um, we've seen some displays uh, in the community that didn't necessarily uh, visual displays that was the opposite message that was that we are not inclusive so our agency got together and the staff um, wanted to have flags that stood for what we believed so um, and what we embraced and that sent a message of inclusivity so we hung a black lives matter flag we hung a lgbtqi flag uh, we have a flag now flying that says stop war because we believe war is hurtful to human beings <laughs> and then we also have a flag that stands behind peace uh, in, in, in all nations that are experiencing war right now um, and then of course we fly an American flag because we believe in democracy that's why we're here um, so that was the first I, I think step that we took Another thing that was really important to us, uh, you know, I moved here, I lived around the world, and I've lived in so many communities. And when I came here, one of the things that was difficult for me was how to find and meet my people, my tribe. Like, where was I going to fit in? So a question that I had to live out in this experience, and it's taken several years, is where do people find community? What is community? So where do people hang together? And if you're only hanging with your people, then you're not going to meet new kinds of people. So at the Parent Child Center, one of the um, things that we really wanted to implement, ideas, was that of transformative community. So to create a, a meeting place where everyone has a place at the table, in conversation, in program. And, you know, Lyle, you, you know the journey of our Two Gen Center but we are opening one PCC place in September, and there is a place for everyone there. There is a place for children who have special needs. There is a place for community groups to organize and come together and have a meeting place uh, for no charge. There is a place for people to come and if they have nowhere else to go to pray together. Um, it, it is um, the Parent Child Center takes this business very seriously. Um, because even though for us at the table it is the right thing, the moral thing, common sense, we can see on the national level that there has been a breakdown of dialogue. And so we want to start in Rutland to have a place where people can come together and dialogue. And the way, the medium that we're using is our programs. So our approach to programming is how we are engaging in transformative thinking. So um, something simple, like our early childhood education program. Uh, right now we're in the process of applying to be a five-star program. Um, we hire intentionally, but we also create a space in our community and our, our staffing. We call our staff community, we call the people we serve community, it's one community circle model. A place where uh, people naturally want to be there because it is a welcoming community. Uh, to, I don't know if you know Ramadan's going on right now and so that is something that our staff are exploring because they're celebrating Ramadan well what does that mean to you how can we how can we you know help you celebrate your holiday how can we create an inclusive space and uh, that is embedded in our organizational values um, but with our ECE kiddos these children are the labor force in 20 years. So um, when I retire in 25, 30 years, uh, these children that I am educating now are the children that are going to be um, supporting our community. They are the infrastructure of our community. They are the community infrastructure. And so 
by b having exposure to diversity, inclusion, equity, and inclusion, and living that out now, we are creating the baseline for 20 years of what the new normal can be, which is, it's kind of silly. I feel like we're years behind here. Like, I can't believe we're having this conversation. Um, the other thing is we are working on um, supporting the workforce, right? So we have uh, families that are working right now. And when they move to the community, we, I, I know that feeling of having children and feeling lost in a new community. I know that feeling of being disconnected. Um, I've been here for five years. I'm still the new director, five years. Um, <laughs> so um, I think that really establishing a place that is community-based. Um, we have a, a new program that we're working on that is remarkable. And it is a, a, community, a, a program that um, helps bring youth from multiple states to Vermont because I think that most people think that Vermont is an idea and I don't think they know it's a real place. And so one of the things that we're working on at our agency is getting people to come to Vermont. So we have this great uh, initiative with Otter Valley High School, with um, school districts in Philadelphia, with PFLAG in New York City, which is the largest um, LGBTQI parent and child uh, agency. And they're gonna come to Vermont uh, with a program that Chris Laro designed that takes youth into the woods, exposes them to other kinds of youth, young adults, and exposes them to Vermont. Because Vermont is a fabulous place to live. Um, that's why I stayed, was because I loved what I found here. And so we have that program going on and I think uh, my final thought is asking people, you know, what, what do you want? Asking people other than uh, the dominant population. Go, I ask my staff, I, ask, I have staff from uh, all, all, all around the world and we have uh, staff of color. What do you need that will make this a place for you? And then listening and then implementing. So I think that these are some of the initiatives that we have in place at the Parent Child Center. Um, but we really want, we want to live out DEI, and not just say we do D, we, you know, we understand it. Thanks, Mary, and thanks to everybody. I'm, I'm impressed with what's been said, and I hope everybody else who is reviewing this program is impressed, but I have some questions. First question I have is, do you have any questions for each other? You heard what each is going to be doing. Does it, did it prompt any kind of question? Did it prompt any kind of opportunity to cooperate or coordinate? I'll, I'll go first. I mean, I love what Lau said about uh, this being a marathon, not a, uh, not a race. Uh, yeah, it's, it's a long run. And, and, and Mary, you talked about, you said, why are we talking about this now, right? Well, at my age, I've talked about this stuff all being black, uh, being having lived in South Carolina and New York and around the country and travel. I've been talking about this all my life in one way, one way or another. It's just that now at this point in life, after corporate life for 20-something years and running my own businesses, I've got an opportunity to really take a leading position. But this is old stuff, and as many folks will, will, will say, it's been going on for 400 years at least yeah. in, in this country. And so, yeah, it is a marathon. It is, it is long. Bob and I and Norm Cohen, uh, the three members of what we refer to as the Gang of Three, are looking at who our successes are. We're doing, we're doing management planning you know, for the future because all three of us are, are at least 80 years old or so. And how do we continue this initiative over 210 towns, right, if it's going to take that long? So I just struck by a couple of things that, uh, that you guys said. The result that we have to have to get people to come here and the things that we have to do, I agree, are a marathon. But don't let, let's not make a marathon something that we kick down the road. I think that the demographic problem that we have is a crisis. And I think we have to employ, when you have a crisis, you have to employ emergency situations. We have to, can't be complacent. 
We have to complain. We have to be more creative, more transformative, look for every opportunity. Because it's a marathon, it's going to take a long time, but you know, it's taken a hundred, a couple hundred years, or a hundred something years to, to realize that the black person is a person. Or you know, the colored, so I, the I, idea of, I like the idea of marathon, but let's take it in short little, let's see some things happening. So one of the things I talked about, I like to ask Al, is when you when you're on your website, and you talk about type, what kind of tactics? What do you, once the person signs, a town signs a declaration of inclusion, what are the tactical things that you are suggesting to them? Do you have any ideas? Sure, yeah, yeah, a, a couple of different, on our, on our website, uh, Vermont Decla Declaration of Inclusion, in fact, we have put a section which we entitle implementation. And in that section on implementation, we talk about what towns uh, can do. And what towns can do is applicable to school boards, is uh, applicable, applicable to companies and corporations, small businesses as well. What Mary is talking about uh, doing at the Parent Child Center is an indication of, of, of what can be done in, in a smaller institution, but in an important institution. Uh, we've, at this point, said there, there are several ways to approach this. And one is it's a step process, not a marathon. Uh, quick and easy, you can do it tomorrow, you can do it today, you can do it uh, the day after tomorrow. One is quick and easy. The second part of it is in-depth imp implementation, which means over time. And the third part is ongoing implementation. And I won't read all of what, I, what I've got here, but just an example of quick and easy uh, is add the declaration to your website. You know, a a put it in your town meetings, put it in your town, uh, your town newsletter, uh, put it in your annual report. You can make a change on your website tomorrow to do those kinds of things. Anything that you publish as a town, have the declaration of inclusion or some variation on, of it, or some statement with the, to the, uh, relevant to the fact that you're welcoming people to more your visibility, community. More visibility, more visibility in the town That's, for the issue itself, you know, for welcoming and yeah. everybody, all encompassing everybody, Certainly. more visibility. Because okay. in some instances, the select board will say, we adopt it, and that's as far as it goes. And we are following up to make sure that, in fact, they take it farther. Because, as I said earlier, saying we adopt a vote in five love, uh, five zero, and not moving on it is, is, is a waste. The real meat and potatoes, the real uh, uh, r result of this whole thing should be you've done something about it, right? The second part is what we refer to as imp uh, in-depth implementation, and it says form a diversity, equity, and inclusion committee. Somebody to really uh, focus on this and to develop a plan, a long-range plan, if you will. Arrange for implicit bias training for city and town. You mentioned that, uh, Lyle, you're doing that. Brainstorm with other adopting towns, creative ways to reach out to marginalized groups and, and individuals, etc. cetera. Uh, task the committee with researching, gathering, and overseeing the most effective ideas for creating a more welcoming community. Uh, assess the current environment, uh, see what you're doing right, what you're doing wrong, see where there might be bias, and see what you can do about that. Uh, urge local schools, not-for-profit uh, organizations, uh, corporations, etc., to adopt a statement of inclusion and offer bias okay. training. And the uh, third part, just one, one last part, ongoing work with school administration to bring inclusion and diversity into the classroom, into not just uh, the social uh, uh, parts of, of the curricula, but art, math, history, uh, woodworking, etc. Work with faith leaders in the community to guide their, uh, their congregations to embrace diversity. Engage the town's library director and other people like that who right. have influence on their community. And lastly, as, uh, as, as you both talked about, creating a concierge service to assist people moving into the community to welcome them here. Well, I have a question. When I hear those guidelines, it's a plan. I'd have to think that in order to get the plan executed, you have to have some monetary expert. You have to stay on it. If you don't measure it, if you don't stay on it, it doesn't get done. It just gets forgotten. It's still a guideline. But I have, uh, you have a comment before I ask my question, Al? Well, I think I may know where you're going, what we're, and maybe not, but what we are doing currently, and just yesterday, we were on a legislative call to try to get funding for tourism and marketing, but specifically for the concierge piece that Al's talking about. That takes assets, and those assets are people. And we need people who can be creating the relationships that will get people to come here, live here, and stay here. Yeah. For example, we have, we've found that we have a couple different kinds of people moving here. We have COVID refugees, and they're coming, and they may want to leave. So we need to make sure we create relationships with them while they're here. 
Killington will tell you, the town of Killington will tell you that they have doubled their population in the last 18 months because of COVID. And those are second homeowners, primarily many of them, but we need to meet them, keep them here for our labor force. It's very important. We also have climate refugees and we're finding that people are coming mostly from, to, through our concierge service, mostly from the Midwest and the West and the Southwest because they don't like the way the climate is. And so when they contact us, we talk a lot about all the amenities here and how beautiful it is here and they, and they do want to come to us, but it takes assets. And that's why we're talking to the state about increasing their tourism and marketing budget and allowing locals to work through with some of that money to get people to come and stay here. But based on what you just said, I recently wrote an article because I, and I got some information from a real estate statements that the people who are moving up in there, 75% of them are millionaires. They could buy a million dollar house in cash. A lot of them, most of them are in financial or high tech. And it occurred to me, that's good, that's good demographic information, okay? And then so two questions applied to me. I said, one, how do you get that kind of person to come down to Rutland? I've been asking that question. We've all been asking that question for years since I've been here. How do you get them to come down? They pass through, they buy some food, they go on. How do you get them to come back? If you, if, you, if you impress them with the energy and the vibrance, and you can get them to come down, then they are going to be more prone to stay here and more prone to tell their friends to come and stay here. But we have to get them to come down. That, so I think that's an interesting thing that we're doing. Where you, whenever you get your money, you have to kind of look at tactical things to see how we can get that huge audience that passes through Rutland to come down and spread the word that Vermont is a great place. So two questions I had. One, and this is the more difficult one, is what is the meaning of Vermont? To you, personally. But every, everything has a meaning. Everything has a, a psychographic meaning. If you, if you're, if you're a, a mo if you drive Harley Davidson motorcycles, you don't buy a motorcycle. You buy the ability on weekends to be a, to be a hood, to get dressed in black and, and threaten people. Even though you're not going to threaten people, you go out and you go and you motorize and you, and you and you take off your financial clothes and your business clothes and you're a different person. That's what they're selling. Uh, so what are, what are we selling? Everybody talks about the, the environment, everybody talks about you know, the, the activities, everybody talks about the beauty, but there's a lot of other places. What's unique to us? I was at a UVM last week and I was speaking to the head of maternal fetal medicine. And he said something really amazing. He said, I am in Vermont, I love the trees. And I know that that might sound so silly, but the environment is beautiful. I mean, I feel like I've tasted the food around the world, all these gorgeous locations, and there's something sacred about Vermont. But I believe that people stay anywhere because of community and their connection to community. And so I think that personally I felt connected, and then I also felt connected because I found a group of innovative, rogue social workers who wanted to shift the system in a way that we were able to help the people who were here in Vermont already have their best life and then connect people moving to Vermont. I do want to say, I just want to kind of plug, I think it's really important if we're talking about people coming from all over the place, this program that we're launching right now is bringing really talented young adults who are about to enter college to Vermont. And we are gonna give them a sense of what Rutland County looks like so that when they go away to college and they do their hero's journey, which they should do, that they then say, well, I wanna come back to that place because that place really spoke to me. You know, so. So welcoming is community. Community is what trust is you can thrive in community, it's acceptance. What else is community? What else is it with involved in, in a welcoming? For us, it's, it's all about relationships, and, and Mary was talking about that, that you need to find a place where you feel comfortable with the people that you're, you're with. And so we work very purposefully in creating ways for people to meet other people. This evening, we have some folks coming from Oregon and we're gonna to go to a restaurant and we've invited a whole bunch of people to come 
to meet them and to mingle and to show them that there are other people here idea. who have exciting, have exciting lives. I think the concierge idea is a good idea because it's very personal. And to have people there, it's onesies and twosies, but I think it's a very good, a good tactical idea and it was really working for us. Here's a question uh, on the opposite pole. What are the barriers of all the welcoming thing? What are the barriers that we're facing and have to be tactful, of course. But the barrier we're facing to that stand in the way of being an attractive place for people to come to and thrive. Well, you, you, at some point somebody mentioned Vermont being an idea, not a, <laughs> not a place. Uh, and, and so you got to have to get over that. Vermont is a, is a real, it's not an, an apocalyptic, uh, uh, you know, resource. It is a real place where, where people you know, come. I've been in Vermont now 32, 33 years, and because I guess I've traveled as much as I've, I have and lived in uh, various places, I feel pretty much comfortable even in an environment where I know I might not be welcomed. Uh, I'm just built that way for whatever, for whatever reason. So I don't necessarily need a whole bunch of people around me, etc. I'm comfortable doing that. That's not everybody. Uh, and I can cite one gentleman who happens to be a vice president of a major medical institution who came to Vermont, happens to be black, and felt very, very uncomfortable here uh, because there were no other blacks, and said, for, you know, four or five months later, I'm leaving. Uh, and fortunately ran into people, and his company recognized that he was struggling for, for interpersonal relationships, and he's now here, and, here, and he's loving it. I'm here, I came here by choice, it's the second place of the eight places I've lived in this country uh, where I've actually made the decision to come and stay and would not want to be any other place. The green state label that we have as a part of our brand, uh, you know, it, it, I think that has legs to it in that we not only want to be green for trees and the, all the stuff we're known for, we want to be a green environment where people can come and thrive and live and, 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 and gain satisfaction. Green in the sense of no stopping, green, no red, no that, stopping. That's right, no limits whatsoever. It is mm -hmm. a fertile environment to come and live, grow, yeah. prosper, develop, be financially uh, 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 stable, all of that. And so, we help. Uh, yeah. Anything you have to say about that particular issue? To go back to the barriers thing, um, uh, the Parent Child Center's uh, tagline is removing barriers. It used to be removing barriers that perpetuate poverty, but what we realized is that there are a lot of working folks in, in Vermont who are near the poverty line, uh, they're the working poor, and so one of the barriers I think to folks coming here and living here and staying here is that there are other people who aren't tech moguls and there are regular people who we need to find uh, help them find a pathway to Vermont. Uh, people who want to relocate from other places and can't afford that. Um, housing is something that needs to be taken care of. There is, a, there is not enough housing to bring people here. And so to, to really be intentional on setting it up, I, uh, when I hire now, I'm hiring and offering housing. And if I have to have people live with me, they will. Yeah. Um, but I think finding a pathway for real people to come here and do the jobs that we can't fill. Yeah. Uh, that was the, when you talk about housing, you talk about opportunity, when you talk about, you know, uh, well, those to me are gimmies. You know, everybody, ha you have to have that. Before you even can start all this welcoming and all the other things and, and the psychographic feeling of Vermont, you gotta have the gimmies. You gotta have a place to work, they have to feel safe, they have to have a place where you can go out of town that's entertaining, that's vibrant, yeah. that has energy. That's, those are gimmies, you have to do those. And those things have to be done. And meanwhile, we have to uh, get involved in the more welcoming thing. Um, I, I, you know, I see, the bar when we talk about barriers, I wanted to ask something else about not barriers and so for more like that. When you talk about 12% of our students are non-white or colored like that, what occurs to me is what are we doing as part of the welcoming, part of the welcoming, to understand the cultures that we expect to come here? I know when I was in the Army, it took a while you're shaving and you're sleeping and so forth with people you haven't even seen, many different colors, many different backgrounds, many different education. It took a while, you had to understand, you had to ask each other the question because to each other we, would, we had to depend on our lives. 
that's real commitment and, and getting so the idea is but we have to understand what are we doing or what can we do in your opinion ideas to understand educate that there's a culture he wears his hat in a certain way he has a clothes he's american but he's but he has still a culture what are we doing about that any ideas so it's, it's a difficult question well it is and it can't happen all, all yeah. at once or overnight but I think that's where our strategic plan comes in because it's making us stop and think about our current behaviors. I can only change my behavior. I can't make Mary do anything Mary doesn't want to do. I can only change what I say, what I do, how I act. And so that's why we're looking internally to ourselves about how, what we're doing, what activities we have. And if we have a festival, is it a festival like you might see 20 years ago? Or is it a festival where it's inclusive? But what does that mean? So we need to look at everything we do and how we do it so that everyone will be comfortable when they come. So we did have the lawn signs where people, it was the LBGTQ lawn signs that said, I love Rutland. And we were distributing those. And that was a conscious decision because we wanna make sure that that community feels comfortable uh, in, in, our, in our region. So that's just an example of an activity that we did. Yeah. Uh, what do we think about the opportunity? I know the governor likes the opportunity of the refugees. I mean, hundreds of thousands of people. You know, they go, 150, I think, 150,000 Afghans. I don't know who's going to come from this poor state of what's happening in the Ukraine and so forth. But that's an opportunity. To me, that's low fruit. That's a person, if we could attract a person here, appeal to the federal government to bring those people here. Those people are educated, a lot of them speak English and so forth. That's, that's low fruit, that's easy. You don't need the marketing, there they are. Are we doing anything extra to get those people? I know we have Afghans coming, we're supposed to get 50 families. I don't know about what's going on. But what can we do in this region to apply to, to appeal to our, our own state legislation and to the federal government that we'll take them? The things that we, are we, what are we doing now currently? Or we're just waiting to see how many, we, how many refugees we get. This is an individual that probably will never go back home. That's, what, that's almost the definition of refugee. They never go back. This is their home. What are we doing to attract them? And what are we doing to establish them, to understand them? One of the things that happens with the refugee community, though, that we need to be mindful of is, is that uh, folks may come here and stabilize and then go where they feel a greater sense of community. And so I think it goes back to the, 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 the key issue here is going to be when they come here, are we connecting folks to community? Uh, and I met with uh, a staff member of mine who uh, emigrated here um, from Morocco and she said, Here's what they do when you come here. You get this, you get this, you get this, but here's what we really need. We need emotional support and connection. And that was what mm -hmm. she and her family said that they needed, that helped them to stay. And she is part of a vibrant community of people who have immigrated here that we don't even kind of keep in our mind's eye. Uh, so I think that that's important. And the other thing is even our food pantry, for instance, our food pantry has a, a really strict policy of who qualifies. Everyone. Everyone qualifies, okay? So you walk in the door, you qualify. But one of the things that's really important is that when you come in the door of the food pantry, that there are foods you want to eat. So we are really careful about making sure we have halal food when we can, making sure that we have food that appeals to the, I mean, food is cultural, right? Uh, so what is the food that we mm -hmm. make food available and we do a questionnaire when people come in? Are there any things here that you, need, that you eat regularly that you need? And then we make sure we have them. Let me be simple, red lentils, uh -huh. you know. So that's what we're doing programmatically. That's an idea for the festivals, the food that has, that has a variety of foods. You know. It's amazing how different we eat and so forth in terms of what we eat. You know, there's nobody sitting at this table here who's not an immigrant. That's right. In one way or another, third generation, yes. you may have been born and spent all of your life here, but your parents or your parents' parents came from someplace else. You did, and I certainly did, and you did too. Look, we're all immigrants. We need to, as, as a society, go back and think about where we came from and think about how we would have felt, mm -hmm. in fact, coming as new people to a, a community. Yeah. This is not our country. We invaded this country. Exactly. There are Native Americans here long before yes. we got here, making an assumption that white people, this mm -hmm. is a white 
white person's country. That's not true. And so, so we need to go back and think deeply about that. But jumping immediately to where we are right now, if I were the governor of this state, and I've said this directly to his people, if I were the governor of this, of this state, looking at what this state's needs are, every, and if I were the mayor of this town, every time I opened my mouth, I would say, we've got a declaration of inclusion. I wouldn't necessarily refer it to, to it as that, but I'd say, we are a welcoming community. We want everybody here, all races, all sexes, all gender, et cetera. We've got an environment here which will support you uh, uh, as a safe and secure place for you to do what you want to do, recognize your life's dreams, have your family be happy here, achieve your economic object objectives right here in this town. And if I'm sitting in Paulette or if I'm sitting in Woodstock uh, and I don't have a declaration of inclusion and Rutland does and Brandon does, I'm at a disadvantage in terms of welcoming, welcoming people and maintaining or retaining people here. And that's why we are trying to work towards having each town, in fact, have a, decla be a declaration because we are, this is a competitive environment with ourselves and with the rest of this country. And in order to be economically enviable, we've got to have something which is different. We've got to be stronger and have a stronger belief about what we say and what we do. Okay. Um, is there any final comments that you'd like to say? to have everybody have. We have about five minutes to go. Is there anything you want to make sure that we're aware, that, that everybody's aware, everybody's a stakeholder? Anything that we want to say finally about what people should be doing, people I, that are watching? I'm just going to play with the metaphor a little bit more. So a marathon, a race, uh, I think I'm going to finish it off with a map. And I think that one of the things I learned in the conversation today was I love that the Declaration of Inclusion has a map. And when you were reading through that, I got 10 ideas of things that I can go do that are very conscientious that are going to take me as we run our marathon. I have a map for where I'm going to be running to it. And I really like that. And I found that really helpful. So thank Mark, you. Any final comments? I go back almost every day and say to myself, I don't know what I don't know. Mm -hmm. And I need to be open to listening. And I need to, to listen more and talk less. And when I do that, yeah. then it shapes what I do and how I act. And so I think we all need to be really keen listeners and be patient. Yeah. One of the key to uh, of understanding the welcoming is understanding the culture. We turn back to the 19th century, the 20, early 20th century, when it first came in, people sought their cultures. I had an idea once about talking about if we're going to build housing, can we build cultural housing? Nice concept, make them feel real comfortable, real comfortable, and because they're Americans, but they still, still bring their culture. Al, any final words? No, I said what I, the last thing I said is, is kind of my final word, and I just invite people to go to the okay. website once again and uh, think about the kind of yeah. thing we're talking about right here. Then I'll say thank you for everybody you viewed. I hope you reviewed it unconditionally with a mind exposed, mind open for everything that's been said here. You're a stakeholder. We need people to come. And, and it's a very important that you get involved as part of these people. Everybody involved gets involved in welcoming, making Vermont a truly welcoming place for all cultures, all colors, all beliefs. I'm Lou Scott. This is Geppetta Room. Until next time. <laughs>